All right, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, my talk is on uh, reentrant superconductivity and uh, multiple superconducting phases in uranium ditaluride. How do I move this thing? Okay. Uh, so, okay, so maybe many of you have seen this. This is the experimentalist phase diagram of uranium ditaluride. It's um, a superconductor at low fields and ambient conditions, and it exists, uh, it exhibits superconductivity at high fields up to 40 Tesla, uh, and even beyond in this uh, mysterious phase up here, uh, it exhibits a fully polarized mag magnetic order. And um, the, the talk that I'll be giving will not concern this, but rather along a very simple, uh, a, a, a linear, along this axis up here. So my talk is gonna be very simple, uh, mostly phenomenological. And if you have questions during the talk, please interrupt. So uh, the first part of my talk is on the phenomenon of, of reentrant superconductivity, as you see by the subscript RE. And I wanna describe what that is and how to understand it. And this is based on insights of my former student, UAU, who's now a postdoc at uh, uh, Wisconsin with uh, Dan Akterberg. And so what we were looking at was, uh, so let me back up for a second. The notion of reentrant superconductivity has been observed experimentally in several uh, superconductors, heavy fermion superconductors, which have uranium and they have ferromagnetism, they have uh, coexistence of ferromagnetism and superconductivity. I give some examples here, uranium, germanium too. You see this non-monotonic behavior as a function of magnetic field. Uh, some are even more dramatic where you kill the superconductivity and it re-enters re at a much higher field, say in this, this system, and also uh, in this last system here, uranium, cobalt, germanium. Now UTE2 is considered a member of this family of ferromagnetic superconductors, even though it by itself doesn't exhibit ferromagnetism. Uh, this is a cartoon uh, plot made, made by experimentalists um, UTE2 is thought to be, uh, lie somewhere down here, so it doesn't have long-range magnetic order, but on the other hand, it has lots of magnetic uh, fluctuations. And so that might be good for superconductivity, as we heard uh, in the uh, morning session. Okay, so if you look at the experimental data, this is the beautiful data of aoki san uh, So there's low field. At low fields, there's a superconducting phase, which is... Uh, destroyed in a magnetic field. And then as you increase the magnetic field, it re-enters. Two things to note in this phase diagram is that at the low fields, the, these are different angles with respect to, so this is an orthorhombic crystal. The field is along the B axis, but you can tilt off of the B axis. And this angle is the tilt off of the B axis. At low fields, the uh, upper critical field is roughly angle independent, but at higher fields, it's strongly dependent on, on angle. So when we understand the, the interesting phenomenon of re-entrance superconductivity, you can ask why, why is TC actually enhanced as you increase the magnetic field if you want to understand the phenomena? Another question you could ask, it's e equally valid, is why is TC suppressed? So this is a somewhat optimistic approach, and this is more pessimistic. Why is TC suppressed in this area? And if you look at each of these separately, first let's ask why is TC enhanced in this area? And if you put on uh, your theoretician hat, you go back to the phase diagram of itinerant ferromagnets. What you see is that there's a ferromagnetic transition. So the axis is say pressure and applied magnetic field. At zero field, there could be a, a continuous transition from uh, paramagnet to ferromagnet. But as you increase the pressure, usually typically what happens is this continuous transition becomes first order at a tricritical point. And then this, curtain, the surface represents a, a, a locus of first order transitions, very analogous to uh, the liquid gas transition. Okay, So what happens across this transition is that the moment, the size of the moment will jump, and this dashed line represents a first order transition. But just like the liquid gas transition, there's a, the, the first order transition surface terminates at a continuous transition, a critical endpoint. And this critical endpoint can be made to be quantum critical by applying, by tuning two parameters. So if you're somewhere down here, you have soft magnetic fluctuations, and those are largely believed to be good for superconductivity. 
And that's what um, that's the cartoon example of why you might see reentrant behavior, say, as you are approaching uh, in magnetic fields, you would be somewhat tuned towards this quantum critical point. So for instance, at low, at low fields, you might first see a decrease in TC, but as you approach this quantum critical point, you might see an increase of the pairing interaction, and that would give rise to a reentrant superconductivity. If you look at the numbers in UTE2, this first order transition between, this is not quite a paramagnet, it's a, a small moment mag a magnet to a large moment magnet. This first order transition has a critical endpoint at about 10 Kelvin, whereas the superconducting TCs are of the order of one Kelvin. So if you want to invoke quantum criticality, that's a bit of a stretch because it's really classical uh, magnetic transitions and the temperature scales are one order of magnitude larger than the uh, temperature scales associated with superconductivity. So enhanced critical fluctuations may not be the most natural uh, explanation. Okay, good. So we, we look for an alternate uh, mechanism for this reentrant behavior. And that's this most more pessimistic approach of why, why is TC suppressed? And what we basically said doing base, simple phenomenology is that let's suppose as a function of magnetic field, there were two distinct superconducting phases. For now, we don't know what they are, A and B. And Landau would tell you that because they have different symmetries, there would be a first order transition between them. And, but the first order transition terminates at a bicritical point, okay? And at a bicritical point, fluctuation effects, thermal fluctuations, and even uh, quench disorder effects uh, play an important role and they can actually reduce TC in the vicinity. So you have a mean field-like transition up here, a mean field-like transition up here into superconducting phase A and B respectively, but in the neighborhood of the first order transition between them, there could be enhanced thermal fluctuations. And that would be a, a viable route towards uh, reentrant behavior, but mostly towards looking at suppression rather than enhancement of superconductivity. And there is some experimental evidence for enhanced fluctuations. For instance, if you look at the resistivity isotherms in the system, what you see is that in the neighborhood of low fields, say five Tesla or so, the resistance drops. These are different, different colors correspond to different temperatures. The resistance drops into the superconducting state and sharply it's across a single isotherm. But if you look in the neighborhood of say 15 Tesla, the resistance drops across many isotherms. That's just an indirect way of saying that the transition is broadened, okay? So the resistance br is broadened as a function of temperature. So that broadening is indicative of enhanced uh, fluctuations, whether it be due to uh, disorder or due to the proximate multi uh, bicritical point. So what we did was we asked, suppose you have this bicritical point um, and it would be first order in, in the vicinity of it, what would be the role of fluctuations? So there's just purely phenomenologically, if you have superconductor A and superconductor B, there's this region of fluctuation, uh, suppression of superconductivity, but at low enough temperatures, there could be a second coexistence or even a complex superposition of these phases. Uh, so that's just from a phenomenological standpoint. The simple theory that we did was we had simple Ginsburg-Landau theory of order parameter A and order parameter B, just you know mean field theory of coupled order parameters. And if you have randomness, the quadratic terms would be spatially varying. And if you look at this region, the, the square and the triangle, what we observed is that if you look at disorder averaged Monte Carlo simulations uh, and, and, um, and looked at the superfluid response in this, square region, there's enhanced superconducting fluctuations. The superfluid density is sig significantly lowered by the presence of disorder. So disorder plays a singular role here and can lower TC. By contrast, in this triangular region, uh, it exhibits more mean field-like behavior. So even as you increase the magnetic field, you recover mean field-like behavior uh, in, this, in this superconducting phase B. So this was our story for uh, the reentrant behavior. And later on, uh, at around the same time, there were NMR measurements, specific heat, AC susceptibility measurements in UTE2, suggesting the existence of multiple superconducting phases uh, as a function of applied field along this 
this B axis direction. And if you go back to basic textbook type uh, examples of bicritical systems, this is from Chaikin and Lubensky, the classic book on condensed matter physics. There's a, a textbook example, which is the spin flop transition. If you take an antiferromagnet, apply a magnetic field at some sufficiently large field, the, the, the spins will flop. And that's a first order transition, which has a bicritical point over here. And you see that the phase diagram is typically, this is an experimental phase diagram. It exhibits this non-monotonic behavior because a bicritical behavior has more fluctuations. So this is a very generic phenomena, nothing unique to UTE2, it's just bicritical physics. Okay, so I told you that there's two distinct superconducting phases. That was the proposal for the reentrant behavior. Now the question is, you know, when you do phenomenology, you don't need to know what those phases are, just Ginzburg-Landau theory. But now I want to address what those uh, distinct superconducting phases are, according to us. And this is work done by uh, my student, uh, Josephine Yu. Okay, so what we did was uh, collab, we, we worked with Dan Achterberg, who had done some uh, uh, first principles calculations in uranium ditelluride. And uh, long story short, if you look at the, dens the density of states near the Fermi level, it's predominantly, so the material is very complicated, but it's predominantly coming from 5F uranium atoms. So you can have a simplified model, which consists of just these uranium atoms, which form this sort of dumbbell-shaped uh, unit cells in this orthorhombic crystal. And so there's two degrees of freedom. There's the spin, but there's also the orbital, because you see there's two distinct orbitals in, in the uranium dumbbells. And if you look at the symmetries of the system, there are mirror symmetries, and there's inversion symmetry, which have well-defined uh, mathematical implementations, okay? So tau is, a sub, is an orbital degree of freedom and sigma is the usual spin. Um, you don't need to follow all the technical details in this talk, but let me just give you the basic picture. If you do group theory in an orthorhombic cr crystal, we, we also say that because a large upper critical field suggests uh, that it must be an odd parity uh, superconductor. There's, a, of course, even parity as well. But if we focus our attention on odd parity, I'll get back to even parity later. There are several distinct uh, irreducible representations in the presence of spin orbit coupling for odd parity superconductors. Now, when you apply a magnetic field, magnetic field breaks certain mirror symmetries. So instead of all the vertical mirror symmetries, if you have a magnetic field along, say, the y direction, the only mirror symmetry that's left is mirror reflection along Y. And so what you find that these four distinct irreps mix and they form only two distinct irreps labeled by how they behave under mirror reflection. Okay, so that's good. We have, we said that there would be two superconducting phases. Group theory says there's two distinct ones. So the natural thing is to say, hey, maybe one of them, uh, AU is one phase and BU is another phase. But the question is, which is which? Which is the low field phase and which is the high field phase? So for that, you need to do some microscopic calculations. And uh, this is just a story based on uh, this DFT model that da Dan Achterberg with his collaborators worked out in 2021. The effective Hamiltonian consists of basically hopping in, in an orthorhombic crystal. So there's orthorhombic symmetry. There's this sublattice structure, just the uranium atoms. It has... Um, some spin orbit coupling. These are heavy fermions after all. So there's some distinct spin orbit type couplings. Um, and in addition, these are anisotropic because it's orthorhombic. It's an orthorhombic crystal. Spin orbit coupling can be anisotropic in such cases. And so um, the first pass without doing any calculation based on just the electronic structure, the single particle Hamiltonian, is you look at linear response to a pair Okay, the pair field susceptibility, this is, this is denoted by this operator D here. And this is, this is only, the only input in this calculation is the band structure that I quickly described to you in the last slide. When you look at, we looked at both odd parity and even parity basis functions for D, but we found that the odd parity states had bigger pair field susceptibilities. And what I plot for you here are the two leading 
eigenvalues, which, which have the largest pair field susceptibility as a function of magnetic field based on this electronic structure. And what you find is that there's one superconducting state which has a large pair susceptibility at low fields and another one which, which dominates at higher fields. The one that dominates at low fields is this BU state. And the one that dominates at higher fields is the AU state, which I'll come back and describe what it means again. So yeah, Pierce. Yeah. It's within, it's got the orbital part as well with this uranium uh, uh, dumbbells. So there's the tau and the, and the spin. Uh, oh, you mean the role of the magnetic field? That, that's an excellent question. So it's all, it's all via the Zeeman effect in this very crude uh, approach, yes. Okay, so uh, now we have to look at actual mean field uh, theory. And if you go back to this, this model that Dan Akterberg uh, and coworkers studied, they also looked at interaction effects and uh, extracted a microscopic Hamiltonian. What it consists of is basically ferromagnetic interactions between different uranium atoms on the sublattice, and then between different uh, between distinct these distinct uh, dumbbells, the interactions are predominantly antiferromagnetic, and this has some experimental uh, support in recent uh, um, neutron scattering experiments. Which, if you took with with a loving eye, they suggest that uh, the interactions, effective interactions, are ferromagnetic within the dimer and antiferromagnetic between dimers. So what we did was we just took the simplest interaction which consisted of this Heisenberg-like ferromagnetic uh, interaction. With, that's what this minus sign is. And this was the effective interaction from which superconductivity is developed, okay? So these interactions are local. They favor opposite sublattice pairing. So it's an orbital singlet-like structure but in the tau space, but they would favor spin triplet pairing. Now, if you look at experimental data uh, of magnetization, what you notice is that the moment is biggest along the crystalline A axis, the X direction. So that suggests while we don't know anything about these numbers, it suggests that JX is probably the biggest number uh, compared to the others. So what, we go what we're gonna do is simple uh, mean field theory, self-consistent solutions of this interaction and look for, you decouple this in some pairing channel, which has sublattice and spin degrees of freedom and we're looking at odd parity, so spin triplet. And you find a simple phase diagram as a function of the Js. So if you fix one of the Js, you look at the phase diagram as a function of the two others, dimensionless ratios, you get a phase diagram like this. So there's one superconducting state here and another superconducting state here. Now, because we want Jx to be bigger than Jz, the, the reason, the region of interest is somewhere in this red uh, shaded region. And what you find is that here, the D vector, the order parameter has the symmetry, this, this vector here along the Y direction, the B axis. And in this direction, and in this region, the D vector is along the Z axis, okay? Um, this is just a plot of the self-consistent order parameter as a function of these Js. Okay, so because we want a superconducting state at low fields, which is, attenuated by magnetic fields along the B axis, we want the D vector at low fields to be in this phase here, okay? So if we select the values of these interactions, Jx, Jy, and Jz, such that we start off at low fields in, in this uh, region outlined by green, um, say the circle over here, and ask what happens in the presence of a magnetic field, what we want to do is effectively move along this phase boundary as you increase the magnetic field. And that would be our proposal for going from one superconducting phase to another superconducting phase. And so at the end of the day, uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes? So, okay, perfect. Okay, so we have a simple phase diagram like this. We have uh, a vector at low magnetic fields, uh, vector order parameter along the y-axis, and then at higher magnetic field, the d vector cants along the z-axis, okay? So you can see this here, the order parameter at low fields. Again, this is via the Zeeman effect, not via orbital couplings. At low fields, 
the uh, D vectors along the Y axis and at high fields, the D vectors along the X axis. So the vector along X is allowed by symmetry. The group theory would say it's allowed, but because the microscopic parameters have uh, the nature of the interactions, because JX is a big coupling, it actually suppresses the D vector along the X direction. So then we have a field-induced transition between these two distinct phases. And as you would expect, as Landa would tell you, uh, the, the transition between these phases would be first order. OK, so this is a microscopic uh, calculation that suggests that these, these two distinct superconducting states are, are present. Now we can ask, what, what are the consequences? What are the consequences of this very simple theory? You see that, go back to this experiment here, that low field phase is pretty angle independent in terms of its magnetic response, but the high field phase is strongly angle dependent in terms of its ma uh, magnetic response. Is that something that this, this theory is cap capturing? Again, the, uh, the approach is extremely crude. The magnetic field is only represented in, encapsulated via the Zeeman effect. But what you notice is that uh, the, this plot shows the superconducting transition temperature, as you sweep the magnetic field, its orientation with respect to the B axis away from the, uh, away from the plane. So at low fields, when you sweep away, TC doesn't change very much. So it's roughly angle independent, but at higher, the high field phase, when you sweep away from the B axis, it's more angle dependent. The TC changes more strongly with, uh, with angles. So that's, the second, the summary of the second part of this talk. So what we did was we considered a simple minimal model that consists of orthorhombic symmetry. It has this sublattice structure of the uranium atoms. It has anisotropic spin orbit coupling. And we had some interactions which are local uh, anisotropic because of the orthorhombic crystal and spin orbit coupling and ferromagnetic interactions. And that led to this phase diagram like this, where as a function of magnetic field via the Zeeman effect, you go from an order parameter whose vector nature points along the Y axis, the B axis, that's killed in a magnetic field along the B axis. And it goes to a high field phase, which is uh, along the Z axis. That high field phase is sensitive to the orientation of the magnetic field, but the low field phase is relatively insensitive. Okay, so what we didn't address in this work are, you know, what are the na microscopic nature of the interactions and spin orbit coupling? Uh, you know, I started off by talking about reentrant behavior, but notice that as a function of field, this is not reentrant. The, the transition temperature doesn't increase. That's because we're doing mean field theory. If you did fluctuation effects in the nature in this neighborhood here, you would see some suppression, and that would be uh, give give rise to reentrant behavior. I also want to say that there's, an, there's a huge elephant in the room, which we didn't consider, but I'm, I'm currently working on this, which is if you look at the gamma coefficient, the ratio, the, the, the coefficient of the temperature dependence of the heat capacity, uh, you see that, which is roughly an indication of the effective mass of the quasi-particles, as, as you increase the magnetic field, this, this quantity essentially doubles. Okay, so that's a huge effect. And as you cross this magnetic transition, which occurs at some 35 Tesla right around here, this gamma coefficient is hugely increasing. So that gives rise to the reentrant behavior as well. And we have some ideas on where this comes from, uh, but I will, I will save you those details. But that needs to be taken into account to fully account for these experimental observations. So let me conclude. I think I'm more or less done. I started by telling you about the reentrant behavior of superconductivity in the system. We had a simple mean field proposal, which, which in, involved multiple superconducting phases. Such multiple superconducting phases have been seen in experiments. And then we did a theory suggesting what the different superconducting order parameters would be. One is AU and one is BU. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>